G'day guys, Mac with the Outer Circle, and in today's episode, we're going to be looking at Games Workshop pricing again. Now, I haven't gone out of my way to really talk about the latest price rise in any real depth because, well, basically, I feel that my job has been over the years to inform people of where I foresaw an issue, and therefore, obviously, I give the uh, the illusion of being nothing but pure salt. This time out, people obviously have taken quite exception to Games Workshop's price rises, which meant I didn't feel I needed to create a video about the situation. Now, there is one caveat to that, and well, why are you getting a video today? And that is that people don't quite understand how Games Workshop price rises have worked in the past. And we're actually getting people who are commenting, well, of course they had to rise the prices, or raise the prices, I should say, to use correct English, uh, because of inflation, the rampant inflation going on around the world. And this is true to a degree. Now, there is one little point I'd like to make on that, and that first is, are they passing on these price rises in the form of a wage increase of 6% to their staff? If not, then you know exactly where the inflationary price rise is going. The second thing is, I've put together a chart here. This chart is taking prices from the year 2000, and I've done this exercise before. I'll take a price, in example here, Falcon Grav Tank. This top line here, all of these, is what the item cost in that year. So I'm just going to put it into a light blue color. So that's fixed in stone. That is the price of the vehicle. And then I've increased it by a percentage each year. That percentage is greater than the average rate of inflation. So much so that it actually equates very, very nicely to what inflation would be in the year 2023 because we're over a half percent every year over 20 odd years of additional inflation, which if you do the math is about an extra 10% inflation. So I've been more than generous to Games Workshop in this situation. So what we're trying to demonstrate here is if you take a price and you know that the model was selling at this, therefore it was profitable at that amount, it was sold at that amount, uh, the company was happy with it at that price and they were making profit on it and that is with the rudimentary sculpting techniques which were slower a lot more labor intensive than today and the rudimentary manufacturing techniques of the year 2000 which were again slower and more rudimentary than today for example back then if you designed a model uh, you would have to physically do it you would do it at three times the size and then we'd use a machine called a pantograph to hand trace every facet of that model into a three times smaller die and then that die was hand finished and you had to lay out the die by hand you had to prototype everything by hand now it's all done in computers and you cnc mill your die to shape and then depending on the quality you're chasing you might use say a milled copper insert to electro uh, use electrolysis method to perfectly form a shape die making is of course beyond the scope of the episode but if you take this price and you raise the price by inflation all the way down this chart, you get to what the price plus 10% extra should be in this year. So this is what it maximum should cost. And every one of these kits I've chosen here has a directly relatable item today. That's why they've been chosen. And I tried to pick a range with a little bit of stuff from fantasy, a little bit from specialist games mostly just 40k miniatures that are still in production so what should something like the falcon grove tank cost same model has been in production since 2000 well the answer is actually 118.32 and it currently costs only 83 so you would think that is a saving but well you see the falcon grove tank had more metal components back then so i've labeled it as an orange and an orange here represents you're slightly worse off, basically, in, in reality. Because metal, as per my notes, white metal uh, turret components plus uh, versus plastic, white metal is nine and a half times more expensive at a minimum than styrene plastic. So, yeah, it basically cuts away your material cost to zilch. Uh, do, do remember that, yes, plastic dyes, injection dyes can cost a lot of money, uh, say 60 grand for a 
full blown dye and all the uh, things that accompany it. But white metal uses silicon, it has to be constantly updated, refreshed with new dyes. The material costs more, it's a lot more labor intensive because each one is done by an individual by hand, it is not machine process, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, et cetera. And this number below it is with the upcoming 6% price rise, which I have not applied to hobby tools in this category. So next one along we have scouts. Scouts were six models white metal is how they were sold. And by the time we go down to current price, so the current price is cheaper than what they should cost. However, you're getting one less model and the material of course has swapped to plastic from white metal. So I consider this you're slightly losing out or it's on the borderline. Space Marine Razorback, not Razorback, Razorback. There we go. So the Razorback would come in at $108.45, but that was with white metal components. Again, the entire, uh, basically upper half of the tank, the turret ring, the turret itself, uh, the crewman in the turret, all of that was white metal. The only thing now that is makes a Razorback special compared to a Rhino is a small twinkling Tevi Bolter or twinkling to Laz Cannon turret, which is completely plastic. That is a significant difference in the weight of the product. Weight, of course, affects things like shipping. Uh, also, the cost of white metal, the cost of labor in white metal, all of that take into account. And I actually consider it quite a loss. Uh, take this as someone who ran a plastics factory for several years. Then we get to Terminators. Terminators is an interesting one because Terminators were made in plastic back in the year 2000. They were also smaller than the current Terminators. Terminators are cheaper now than inflation. And this is reflected in the graph. The top two lines here, lines uh, that are beside 25, the top two lines on the Terminators graph, which I'll zoom right in on, represent what the price should be and the inflation adjusted price or the extra 6% they're about to tack on. Now with that amount tacked on, Terminators are going to cost more than they should. But for this very split second point in time, Space Marine plastic Terminators are actually slightly cheaper proportionally than they were back in the year 2000. And you can see the curve, the uh, graph over time, gets basically steeper and steeper and steeper as things go along. And we also see this pattern sort of happening over other charts. So moving along, the Chaplin on bike. Chaplin on bike, fully plastic kit now, was a partial white metal, partial plastic kit in the past. The bike was plastic, the Chaplin, all the upgrades were metal. Now the bike is slightly bigger, being a Primaris bike, but it is entirely plastic. Like I said, plastic a lot cheaper to manufacture, and it is an automated process. So, why is it nearly twice the price? Greed. Uh, Avatar. Avatar is another good one. So the Avatar was $39.95, a 100% white metal model. And should cost $78.84 today if it was still manufactured. Current price, 165 and this is one that is swapped to plastic, so it's a 10 times cheaper medium, 10 times cheaper material, which is easier to produce. Again, really got to ram home that point for the people, the naysayers at home. And uh, as I've noted here, was white metal. And it's about to go to 174.90 roughly with the 6% price rise that we've been informed is coming. So that hurts. Uh, Codex. Well, Codex is a strange one because it should cost $68.98 and it does cost $84, but I haven't put it in red because my opinion is it is hardcover now and it is full color and there are more pages to it as well. So I think in all fairness, you can't say that Codexes cost more and we're worse off necessarily. Uh, they don't have the same lifespan that they used to is a, is a valid argument, but I think dollars for dollars they're probably in the right place. Same again with Necromunda. Necromunda, uh, back in 1998, I think the box set came out, was still sold in 2000, their starter box. 
It was a little bit cheaper than today, but it also used more card in the box uh, than the current set does. The current set is entirely plastic terrain. Back then, it was a mixture of plastic and cardboard terrain. So I'm going to call that roughly equivalent, hence orange. Warlord Titan. Warlord Titan's another interesting one. It was about two-thirds the size of the current Warlord Titan. In fact, it was about the size of a current Reaver Battle Titan, uh, the Warlord Titan from the year 2000 from Epic 40k. And it was, again, a 100% white metal. And it would cost $81.71 today, and the plastic replacement to it is 180 ripoff dollary dues. Good point in the video to point out that these are all Australian dollary dues, not American dollary dues, um, or what are they called? Uh, freedomy dues? I don't know. Uh, and they're not UK pounds. So if you run this exercise for different countries, you're going to get slightly different results because of various economic shenanigans caused by the so called account nomancers. Now, cutters and files, tools that uh, were in production then are still in production today, and as you can see, significant price increases. Not so much on the files, but you'll note you actually went from three files down to two in the packet today. So you are getting less product. You're getting only two-thirds of what you used to get, as well as it costing more, and the cutters are more than double what they should be inflation-adjusted. And cutters, as you all should know, are a very cheap and easy tool to produce, produced in mass, even in Western countries. Uh, Stegodon was white metal, now is plastic. In plastic, it's 83. In white metal, it'll be 147. Again, tier of cost, 10 times cheaper. Don't have to have all that physical one person operating one die at a time, yada, yada. It should cost a lot less. Saurus, Saurus Warriors, the, they were sold in sets of 8, so I doubled it to a set of 16, uh, which is in line with the current box, which sells 15, and, well, the price speaks for itself, so $30 roughly extra you pay for Saurus uh, in the year 2023 versus inflation. I also did the Star Master Slan. Uh, which is just going out of production because a new and very nice looking model is coming out and Lord Croak and as you can see obviously uh, white metal versus fine cast here and white metal uh, versus plastic um, it's a bigger kit but a hollow plastic kit volumetrically still using far less material than a solid white metal uh, cast part was uh, so don't think just because it's bigger you're getting more value for your money if it's hollow still fucking hollow. Tactical Marines. Uh, the Tactical Marines are just a little bit more expensive than they should be, realistically, um, for the year that we're actually in. So that's something to point out right there. Uh, very important one to point out, I think, for people. The Tactical Marines is very important, though, and I'll come back to that in a moment because we have a couple of graphs here. And as you can see, the Tactical Space Marines top two lines of the graph is where they're sitting at currently and the third line down is what they should be costing and you can see it's quite a significant gap we'll cover off on that later uh, and of course the avatar by the way um, if I can pull this graph into position where you can read it you can see just how much uh, that gap is the third line where it should be and the upper two lines where it is currently is insanity um, and of course we've also got the Space Marine Captain, Orc Boys, and the Buggy, all of which, uh, yeah, suffer. The Buggy is the closest, I mean, it's a bigger model now, it was plastic, it is plastic, the model's probably nicer now than the old Gorka Morka Plastic buddy, Buggy. Um, the Orc Boys, though, significantly, uh, more expensive than they were, and the Space Marine Captains, characters in general, we notice this trend, whether it's Avatar, whether it's your chaplain on bike, whether it's the Space Marine Captain, they're about three times more expensive than they should be, and they've also transitioned to a far cheaper material. My belief here is one of two things could be going on. Either they are individual models, therefore they're going to sell less, therefore because they sell less, they want to try and recoup the cost of the manufacturing, design, dyes, etc, etc, uh, more quickly, and in order to do so, in order to justify the investment, they are charging more for those individual models. 
in all likelihood though they're going to sell a lot of these over one period of time and they are the ones who are insisting not the player base on creating 500 different Primaris lieutenants in plastic that aren't needed and therefore they're causing more die costs on themselves and I think it's a, a poor move myself and it's not one I would be making if I was running this particular organization and then lastly if we can get over to it tacticals versus tacticals reality the numbers on the right are actual figures or costs pulled from White Dwarf over the years. And you can see each price jump from when they went from 30 to 40 to 50 to 55 to 65 and to 70. Okay, so these are the price changes in both starting at the same point. 10 tactical space marines cost you this much in 2000. This is what inflation would adjust it to. You're still getting 10 Marines, you're still getting the same stuff in the set. It's just been slightly differently sculpted over the years. So you can see there's a difference. Now that actually translates to this big graph here. And the blue line is what it should cost. The orange line is what it does cost. Ignore the numbers on the left. That's not the year, that's not 2024. That is, uh, it's just, I've used 24 lines of data. So the orange is where their prices have sat versus the inflation at the same time. Why is this important? Well, it means that everything in orange is extra money they made over what it's costing them in theory with the product. So what I mean by this, well, if I know that I can sell you a product right, like a tactical squad, and that I'm going to make profit, cover all my expenses, pay my staff, pay for my stores, pay for my insurance, my materials, everything. If I know I can do that, and it's these blue lines, but I'm charging you the orange line, how much extra do you think I made? As you can see, the tactical squad has never ever dropped below inflation. Every time inflation looks like it's just starting to catch up, that line jumps, they do a price rise. So they are making additional profit on every single one of these. And what do you think happens to line 24 if I add an extra 6% onto it for the next price rise? It's obviously going to be a huge jump. So what this means in reality is not that Games Workshop was losing money and that they have to do a price rise on us. They have to add an extra 6% today because if they don't add an extra 6% right now, the company's just going to suffer. No, what it means is in order to maintain this ridiculous constant runaway of profit, they have to continuously increase the price because this money here is the money that's going to the shareholder dividends. The difference between orange and blue is basically the additional or extra growth that the company is having. And it's a very funny situation where they raise the prices by a lot. They're making a, a bunch of extra profit in the short term. Because if you look at, at line four, for example, line four here, um, just above the writing, you can see that it's it's a much bigger difference between the orange and blue than if we go up to say line seven, right between the orange and blue compared to line four, it's a lot bigger. So that's the point where they then raised prices because they had you know 5%, 10% less profit they were making against inflation because the costs were starting to catch up to what they were charging for the product. They never fell behind it though. They never have taken a hit for their pricing on this particular unit. And this is true across most of the board. Again, you can run this exercise for tons and tons of different units and items. And like I said, I make lots of little notes on them about important things. So, you know, hardcover, was white metal, was white metal plus plastic, etc. etc. I made notes for fairness as I went. So when someone says to you, Games Workshop in 2023 has to do a 6% price rise because inflation over the last year has really hurt them, one, they haven't done their research. Two, they are probably defending the giant corporation that doesn't need to be defended, which I generally frown upon to some degree. Another thing to that is, of course, are they passing this price rise on in the form of a 6% increase in wages to their workers to at least help their staff? Because if the inflation is so great 
that the company is suffering uh, financially because of the burden of all these prices that are rising globally and that they just they've tried to help us the customer but they just can't avoid it they have to raise the prices well their staff are suffering so this price rise should really be passed on to them in the form of six percent increased wages i doubt the staff are going to go above three percent increased wages this year and that's only because two and a half percent is what the government roughly mandates i think it's about 2.17 percent in fact uh, but I could be wrong on that figure, so please feel free to verify that. Uh, and if you're in the know in economics, please uh, correct me in the comments below. But that's where my head is at. I highly doubt the staff are going to see the 6% passed on to them. So where is the 6% price increase going to be passed on? Well, you know exactly where it's going. It's going to line some pockets and it's probably going to pay for some very expensive people in the head office of the company who are making these price rising decisions essentially so will this be the last price rise we see well it used to be as you can see here four or five years that you would pretty consistently get out of a product between major price rises and now that time period that time frame is starting to shorten because you know that line 24 here is about to go up by six percent because that is current year price before price rise so We've had, what, two price rises in the last few months, basically. One that hit re independent retailers, one that's about to hit everyone. We also had another price rise in the middle of last year, and we had another price rise early last year. So this stuff is getting a bit out of control at the moment. And Games Workshop's in a very funny position, which I've tried to warn people about, but they sort of see it as, I don't know, we'll call it salt posting, who knows, where I say that you have a majority player base right now, which is by buying the product at a certain price point. And the higher you raise those prices, the more people drop off. And you end up in this self-deprecating or self-eating cycle, or replicating cycle, perhaps the better term, where Games Workshop raises prices, people drop off. Games Workshop has to raise prices more to keep the profits high, to keep the growth up, to keep the investors happy, in order to counter for the fact that more people just left the hobby. Because these prices that you see in 2000 were what was affordable back then for a person getting in. And as you can see, the cost now, if you wanted to buy an avatar proportionally to what you earned back in 2000, or you want to buy a Warlord Titan, you could do it, I know, because I did it. I saved up my lunch money. You know, it was about 10 days of lunch orders from high school. I um, didn't eat lunch. You know, didn't get the meat pie and the Coke. Um, that's, that's Aussie food. Meat pie probably means different things in different countries. But anyway, enough of that. I saved up my pocket money and I bought myself a War Titan. And it was uh, a Lucius pattern, I think it was. And I painted it like that uh, Dark Angels green sort of color, because that was sort of the, the style at the time. Um, but if I wanted to buy it today, I'd be spending $180. That's not 10 days of pocket money, you know, of skipping lunches as a kid in Australian school, because you it's, a, it's over a month. So it's a huge difference there. Um, that's quite concerning to me, because kids were the lifeblood of the hobby you tried to get them in when they were teenagers early teenagers and then they stuck with the game now it seems to be they get them in the door they sell them the starter set they make all the profit they want from that starter set and then the kids can't afford anything else so they don't return you get maybe one in ten something like that return customers and that concerns me because you need new blood entering the hobby in order to pay for things to keep the growth there of the hobby as a whole not the growth as in monetary and there was once a point in time where you would go into your games workshop on a Friday evening or a Thursday night and it would be full, like 30 kids, and there would be three, four staff members working in there. There'd be a manager behind a counter looking over everything, making sure no one was stealing stuff. There'd be a guy who was running painting classes at the painting table. There'd be another couple of people who were actually running games. One would be running a big table where they put two or three tables together running fantasy, and one would be putting two or three tables together and running 40k games and they'd be running concurrently and there'd be like 10 15 kids at each table and it was mostly teenagers well today it's the same teenagers 
like myself that are now 30s going into their 40s that are playing the game. And we are older, we have disposable income, we can afford the hobby. But it seems to be that they're trying to chase people doing, I don't know, university aged, maybe mid 20s age, who have maybe not even disposable income, they just have income and they blow it unwisely on the hobby. But I'm not seeing the growth, I'm not seeing the repeat kid comes in, buys product, that same kid is there every Thursday or Friday playing games after school like I did. I don't see that when I go to the hobby shop. I recognize a few adults in their 20s doing that, but games workshops are ghost towns compared to when I was a kid. And this is due to the deliberate malfeasance of their marketing teams and their trainers. The people who are running the show of the company, they don't want to run a hobby store. They want to run a sales department out of their stores. They don't want to invite people in. They don't want to have people buying the product, building it and painting it in store and playing it and having fun because they think that that's a drain on the staff member who should be selling product. Or at least that's reliably how I've been informed. And that's a real shame because part of the attraction as a kid was you go to this place and you buy in because you have somewhere to build, paint and play. And the enthusiasm of seeing others doing it is what drives and motivates you. And thinking back to my episode on impulse buying the other day, look at our community currently. You know, when I use the term community, I'm referring to people collecting the hobby as a whole. How many people are just doing this this shit posting of check out the stuff I bought, like purchase flexing, I think I'm going to call it. Okay. People are purchase flexing Warhammer. In my day, old man Macca here, in my day, purchase flexing was just not a thing. You didn't buy a dozen boxes at a time because, well, one, you couldn't afford it, especially when you're a teenager. But the whole point wasn't that you purchased something. Nobody gave a crap that you purchased something. There was no social media where you, you flexed on it and took a photo with the staff member. Because the whole point was build, paint, play. Okay. Now, I understand there's a fourth dynamic to it, collecting. Fine, collect to your heart's content. I don't know why you'd need to collect 10 boxes of the new corn berserkers, but some people feel that way. But for me, it was that whole thing. You build it, you paint it, you play it, and you weren't allowed to play it until you'd built it and painted it. It was very, very strict back then. And it was a good thing because you watched other people playing and how much fun they were having, and it fucking motivated you. It motivated you to do better. Because what is the point of achieving something? What is the reward of something if you're not being picked up and motivated and achieving something? If you're just getting the cheap social media praise of people giving you a like on social media of some description because you bought something, what have you actually earned? What have you achieved there? You've achieved nothing, therefore the praise is worth nothing. That's just a funny situation we find ourselves in. And you're probably sitting there right now having lost track of the original topic and going, what the hell does this have to do with prices? Well... If kids can't afford it, kids aren't getting in, they're not being motivated by seeing people in the stores building, painting, playing, then they're less likely to go and purchase in the first place. Because even if they could afford it, if the game doesn't look fun, if there's nobody playing it, you know, and it's part of the, the, the kidification of the game. They're trying to make things a little bit more cutesy, a little bit less grim dark, a little bit more mainstream, forgetting the fact that, well, the people making these decisions are idiots because there's one thing they should remember from being a teenager. It's teenagers like to be treated as adults. They're not, but they want to feel more important than they are because they feel they want to know they've got a place in the world, that they're a chick something. And, and they're not getting that right now if you're kidifying the game. The kids like myself got into the hobby because it was this heavy metal, it was this adult environment, okay? It was not some cutesy schmaltzy game it was like this is serious stuff this is an adults only thing it's almost taboo and that was part of the appeal of it and you're killing off that appeal unfortunately as a company games workshop so all of this plays into the pricing because i see prices as a problem not for me i am an adult in a well-paying job who has a wife who also is a well-paying job and together we share the burdens of household bills and what's left over we can do with as we wish we can go on a holiday we can you know 
build yourself a uh, hobby room. That's what I'm doing. I'm building a new hobby shed on my property uh, because I'm building a new house. And that's great. Now I can afford this hobby. But at some point, I'm going to be a guy who's in his 40s or in his 50s who can still afford his hobby. And he's got all his miniatures collection. And he doesn't have anyone to play with. Only other 40 and 50 year olds. I don't get to pass down my legacy to a new generation. I don't get to hit that point where I say, you know what, I think I've... Yeah, I think I've had my fill of this hobby and I'm going to donate my armies to, you know, a teenager or something. That's not going to happen because you've already hit the point now where teenagers can't afford the hobby and it's people in their 20s who are getting into it. Will I get that awesome legacy that the people before me got to do, the people who were in their 40s and were teaching me how to build and paint and play? Well, if I don't get to pass that on to someone, that's kind of disappointing. Because the hobby is just sort of dying off. And that's, I don't know, we're not there yet. I really want to stress that point. But that is the potential future. And that is why prices matter. It's not because I can't afford them. I don't give a shit. I can afford it. It could be 10 times the price they are and I can still afford it. That's not the point. The point is the up and coming generation has to get in. And if you make something beyond the reach of the next generation coming up, that's how you kill a hobby. And if you don't believe me, Look at different hobbies that used to exist and don't now, whether it's down to cost or whether it's down to appeal of the hobby. There are so many hobbies that have gone by the wayside. Anyway, that's it for me. This is Mac with the Outer Circle. I hope you found this to be a somewhat informative episode. We should be doing a live stream tonight, just a smaller, more condensed one. We're going to look at a few of the Legion specialist big boy units like Kizagana, Landspeeder, um... Syrian Dreadnought, that kind of thing. So if you're around, join us then. Uh, that'll be probably be happening about 9.30 Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. Um, which for those of you uh, who live in different parts of the world, you can look that up because I'm not doing the conversion for you because I've got to go edit this video now. Uh, and it's Saturday morning and I'm tired because I was at a wedding for the last 14 hours. Anyway, thank you all for watching and I'll see you all on the next one.